All right, so as I was saying, the respiratory system physiology is divided into three important processes. So you have ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration, right? Now, ventilation is actually breathing. So that's what breathing is. We often use the term respiratory or respiration to, to classify breathing. But when we talk about respiration, we're actually talking about the exchange of gas. So ventilation is actually breathing. Now, ventilation is the mechanical action of breathing in and breathing out. So it's a mechanical action of breathing in and breathing out. And ventilation has two phases. It has a phase that is active and it has a phase that is passive. Mr. McKenzie, you have a question? So it has. Oh, Why am I hearing feedback? All right. Let me see if anybody's logged in twice. Okay. All right. So ventilation has two phases, a phase that is active and a phase that is passive. Active means muscle contraction is required. Passive means the muscles relax. Now, the two phases of ventilation is inhalation or inspiration and exhalation or expiration. And the active phase would be the inhalation phase. So that's a phase where the intercostal muscles will contract and the diaphragm will contract as well. The, the passive phase is the exhalation or expiration phase. So this is a phase where the, <clears throat> the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm will relax. So that's ventilation, process of ventilation. O, which is oxygenation. When we talk about oxygenation, oxygenation is specific to the red blood cells within the body. So it has to do with the ability of the red blood cells or erythrocytes to bind to oxygen molecules. So the hemoglobin pigment on the red blood cells bind to oxygen molecules. Once the red blood cell is able to bind to four oxygen molecules, then the cell is said to be oxygenated. That is the process of oxygenation, right? So ventilation is the movement of the, the ear in and out of the lungs. Oxygenation is the concentration of oxygen present that is able to bind to the red blood cells. Respiration now, when we start to talk about respiration, this is the actual exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen within, within, the ear sacs and the blood that's coming from the, the right side of the heart. So that is respiration. The exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And it can occur in the lungs and it can occur within the cells inside of the body. So you have what is referred to as pulmonary respiration and cellular respiration. So functions, 
functions is the sorry <clears throat> the respiratory system physiology function is to provide body the body with oxygen and eliminate carbon dioxide ventilation and respiration are two separate independent functions of the respiratory system ventilation is a movement of air the mechanical action of breathing has nothing to do with gas exchange respiration is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide so respiration is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the alveoli and tissues so you have pulmonary respiration and cellular respiration it provides oxygen to the cells and remove waste which is carbon dioxide and this exchange occurs via the process of diffusion which is the passive process in which oxygen molecules move from the ear from areas with a higher concentration of oxygen molecules to areas of low oxygen concentration and then the area of the brain that is responsible for controlling breathing is the brain stem which is the smallest portion of the brain and one of the most well protected because it basically controls all life sustaining functions so the brain stem divides into the medulla oblongata and the pons within the medulla of the brain stem it initiates the ventilation cycles and it is stimulated so it's stimulated by heart sorry by high carbon dioxide levels and i'll talk more about that mr graham <clears throat> sorry mr graham yes sir more right. again um yes sir. diffusion is the process of oxygen moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration of the body right correct okay all right done. all right <clears throat> excuse me I had to drink some water here the pons has two areas that help augment respiration during periods of emotional and physical stress ventilation is simple ear movement into and out of the lungs it requires chest rise and fall and you have an active phase and a passive phase active phase is the inhalation phase this is where your intercostal muscles will contract this is where the diaphragm will contract the passive phase is when the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm relax now tidal volume is the amount of air moved into or out of the lungs during a single breath so tidal volume is the amount of air moved in to or out of the lungs during a single breath now it's it can be calculated but as emts you don't have that equipment available to you to work it out so what we use to determine adequate tidal volume is whether or not we can see adequate chest rise and fall and is the patient communicating with us if a patient is talking to you and can see visible chest rise that's adequate tidal volume no dead space dead space is anywhere or any portion within the respiratory system or respiratory tract where the exchange of gas cannot occur so anywhere within the respiratory tract in which air which it, in which gas exchange cannot occur is referred to as dead space the respiratory rate 
times the tidal volume will give us what is referred to as the minute volume, which is the amount of air we are breathing in and out within a minute. Always evaluate the amount of air being moved with each breath when assessing a patient's respiration. So we're getting to the assessment phase now. We're slowly moving into the assessment phase. So the characteristics of normal breathing. So we have looked at the structures in the upper airway and the lower airway. We have looked at the functions of the upper airway and lower airway structures. Right? We have looked closely at the process of ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration. We have looked at dead space, which is very important because dead space is constant. And I'll talk more about it when we do, when we go into airway management and minute volume and how the, the tidal volume and the respiratory rate contributes to that. We need to know what are the normal characteristics of breathing. So the characteristics of normal breathing includes a normal rate and depth. So it must be within a normal rate and there must be adequate rise and fall of the chest. The rhythm must be consistent. So we look at the rhythm. Is it regular or irregular? Is it consistent? Right? We listen for clear long sounds. We look for muscle use. We look at the position which is referred to as the quality of breathing. And we pay attention to the depth. Can we see adequate rise and fall of the chest bilaterally? So learn this now, because this is going to be important to your assessment, right? This is gonna be very important to your assessment. Whenever we are assessing a patient's breathing, so when we're examining the lower airway, when we're assessing the lower airway, we will look at rate, rhythm, quality, and depth. I did not say you look at one. You look at four things. So you cannot look at one to determine what your treatment for the patient is gonna be. You need to assess all four, rate, rhythm, quality, depth. And when you're being examined, do not tell me, sir, may I go check rate, rhythm, quality, and depth. And then when I ask you, what does it mean? You can't tell me. So don't just swap the information. You need to understand what it means. So the rate, is how fast or slow the patient is breathing per minute. The rhythm is consistency. Is it regular or is it irregular or is it absent? And when you look at a patient's breathing rate, is the patient breathing fast? Is the patient breathing slow? Is it, is it absent? Right, so is it fast, is it slow, is it absent, is it normal? For the consistency or rhythm, do I see a regular pattern of chest rise or is it irregular? Then, so that's rate, rhythm, quality. Quality is, do you see muscles being used? Is it positional, meaning the patient has to be in a specific position to get ear into the lungs, right? So <clears throat> is there muscle use? Is it positional? <clears throat> Are there abnormal lung sounds present? So that's quality. Depth, can you see chest rise? 
bilaterally? Am I able to see chest rise bilaterally? And if chest rise is present bilaterally, is this patient communicating with me? That's how we assess breathing. And we are very famous, right? So we're very famous in the medical field. It's not specific to EMS in every area. EMS, nursing, medicine, medical doctors to shortcut assessment. And if you shortcut the assessment, your treatment will be incomplete. And you can miss things that can determine whether your patient lives or dies. Go ahead, Mr. Card. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Um, the dub, sir. Can you please repeat about the dub? Okay. The depth is whether is the tidal volume. So the tidal volume is is the same as depth. So it's whether or not you're seeing chest rise and fall on both sides. So when you look at the patient's chest, does the right side and the left side of the chest come up at the same time and go down at the same time? Are you able to see this clearly? That's what depth is. Um, you got that, Mr. Card? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. All right. Now, please note that I'm spending a lot of time on this particular slide because this is an area. So this is an area that EMTs struggle in, whether it's during the course or in their field care in the field, right? So your assessment of the airway must be immaculate. There is no room for errors in a patient that is critical. And for you to be able to limit errors that can kill your patient, your assessment must be thorough. Right? <clears throat> now, if, if you can clearly identify the characteristics of normal breathing. So if you know for sure what you're looking for with normal breathing, anything outside of that would be considered inadequate or abnormal. So if the patient is using muscles to breathe, that's not adequate breathing. If you can see muscle retractions, the muscles being pulled in, around the ribs. That's not normal. If the patient's skin looks pale or blue, cyanotic, cool, damp skin, these are all indicators of poor breathing. If the patient is tripoding, and tripod mean they, they, they are leaning forward with the, the hands on the legs and they are working to get that ear into the lungs, that's tripod position or you note agonal gasp. And agonal gasp in street terms is when you hear somebody say, him did a gap, did a gap for breed, right? So agonal gasp is the patient is gasping, but it's not considered adequate breeding. In fact, it is considered no breeding, right? All right, now they, hold on, let me check something real quick. Oh, we're actually going into the circulation system, okay? All right, so we're at the end of the respiratory system. I don't want to start circulatory until after lunch. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to start the circulatory system tomorrow morning. So we're actually ahead of the game. Are there any questions? Okay. 
Go ahead, Mr. Graham. Yes, sir. Um, you said we will revisit about the um, breathing pattern and all that stuff later on. Definitely. Because, Definitely. Uh, okay. It's an important system. So, matter of fact, majority of the systems will be reviewed again. <clears throat> right now, the what I am covering now with you. The questions that you will see on Monday will not be as complex. The questions that you're going to see on Monday will follow more of the general knowledge pathway. So it's more it's going to focus more on general knowledge. As we get deeper into the course, then we start to look at critical thinking. But I am presenting it in this way for you to have a deep understanding from early. So you need to establish a, a deep core understanding of the systems at this early stage, that when we start to get into the various emergencies, you have that foundation already there, and you don't have to be going back now to try and um, grasp the, the physiology of a particular system when you need to know, think about abnormal presentation and treatment, right? And <clears throat> anatomy and physiology is something that has to be continuous. So even after you have covered the, the chapter and you have done the exam, and you have passed the course. It's something that you have to continually review. You need to be familiar with all the systems in the, the body and how they function. The deeper your understanding of anatomy and physiology, the, the, the wider your, your range of understanding as it relates to the patient's presentation. So if I have a good grasp of anatomy and physiology. I know what are the signs and, and symptoms to look for. So I'm aware of the signs and symptoms that I need to look for if something is wrong with that system and I don't need to, to swat it. And that's what we are trying to avoid at this stage when it comes to understanding. We don't want to swat the information. We want to understand the fundamentals of that system and how it functions, right? So swatting won't help you with understanding. It's not gonna work out. But the questions on Monday will be more general knowledge. So it's an, I would say it's an easy exam. So if you're not able to pass that exam, you, you're in trouble, you're in, you're in serious trouble at that point if you cannot pass that exam. It's going to be the easiest exam in the, the course. So I don't expect, what is 30, 30 persons in the room now, and I expect all 30 to pass on Monday, right? If you don't pass, you can hand in your resignation. I'm just kidding, right? Just kidding. But ensure that you put in the work. Put in the work from early, get a deep understanding from early. It's going to be beneficial to you going forward. So everything that you study, you don't study it and put it one side. Everything that you cover, you're going to carry it forward. You're going to see it again in other chapters. And if you already know it, you don't have to cover it in the, the chapters to come. That's the approach that you need to take. All right, with that said, why are we concerned about the amount of questions? If it's 70, 100, or 200 questions, it's general knowledge, study, answer the questions. So the number of questions is not that important, right? It ain't. But um, it's 70 questions. Go ahead, Miss. Roxburgh, go ahead. Hi, everyone. 
Yes. 